Chapter One, Part One of the Boy Scout Aviators. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kangaroo. The Boy Scout Aviators by George Durston. Chapter One Serious News. Part One. As long as I can't be at home, said Harry Fleming, I'd rather be here than anywhere in the world I can think of. Rather, said his companion Dick Mercer. I say, Harry, it must be funny to be an American. Harry laughed heartily. I'd be angry, Dick, he said finally, if that wasn't so English and so funny. Still, I suppose, that's one reason why you Britishers are as big an empire as you are. You think it's sort of funny, and a bit of misfortune, don't you, to be anything but English. Oh, I say, I didn't quite mean that, said Dick, flushing a little. And of course you Americans aren't just like foreigners. You speak the same language we do, though you do say some funny things now and then, old chap. You know... I was ever so surprised when you came to Mr. Grenfell, and he let you in our troop right away. Didn't you even know we had Boy Scouts in America? asked Harry. My word, as you English would say, that is the limit. Why, it spread all over the country with us. But of course we all know that it started here, that Baden-Powell thought of the idea. Rather, said Dick enthusiastically. Good old bathing towel. That's what they used to call him at school, you know, before he ever went into the army at all. And it stuck to him, they say, right through. Even after Maeve King, he was called that. Now, of course, he's a lieutenant general. And all sorts of a swell. He and Kitchener and French are so big, they don't get called nicknames much more. Well, I'll tell you what I think, said Harry soberly. I think he did a bigger thing for England when he started the Boy Scout movement than when he defended Maeve King against the Boers. Why, how can you make that out? asked Dick, puzzled. The defense of Maeve King had a whole lot to do with our winning the war. That's all right, too, said Harry. But you know that we may be in a bigger war yet than the Boer War ever thought of being. How can a war think you, chump? asked the literal-minded Dick. Again, Harry roared at him. That's just one of our funny American ways of saying things, Dick, he explained. I didn't mean that, of course. But what I do mean is that everyone over here in Europe seems to think that there will be a big war sometime. A bigger war than the world's ever seen yet. Oh, yes, Dick nodded his understanding and grew more serious. My potter... He's a V.C., you know, says that too. He says we'll have to fight Germany sooner or later, and he seems to think the sooner the better, too, before they get too big and strong for us to have an easy time with them. They're too big now for any nation to have an easy time with them, said Harry. But you see what I mean now, don't you, Dick? We Boy Scouts aren't soldiers in any way, but we do learn to do the things a soldier has to do, don't we? Yes, that's true, said Dick, but we aren't supposed to think of that. Of course not, and it's right, too. But we learn to be obedient, we learn discipline, and we get to understand camp life and at the open air, and all the things a soldier has to know about sooner or later. Suppose you were organizing a regiment. Which would you rather have? A thousand men who were brave and willing, but had never camped out, or a thousand who had been Boy Scouts and learned half the things soldiers have to learn. Which thousand men would be ready to go to the front first? I never thought of that, said Dick, mightily impressed. But you're right, Harry. The Boy Scouts wouldn't go to war themselves, but the fellows who were grown up and in business and had been Boy Scouts would be a lot readier than the others, wouldn't they? I suppose that's why so many of our chaps join the territorials when they are through school and start in business. Of course it is. You've got the idea I'm driving at, Dick, and you can depend on it that General Baden-Powell 
had that in his mind's eye all the time, too. He doesn't want us to be military and aggressive, but he does want the Empire to have a lot of fellows on call who are hard and fit, so that they can defend themselves in the country. You see, in America, and here in England, too, we're not like the countries on the continent. We don't make soldiers of every man in the country. No. By Jove, they do that, don't they, Harry? I've got a cousin who's French, and he expects to ter serve his term in the army. He's in the class of 1918. You see, he knows already when he will have to go, and just where he will report. Almost the regiment he'll join. But he's hoping they'll let him be in the cavalry instead of the infantry or the artillery. There you are. Here and in America, we don't have to have such tremendous armies, because we haven't got countries that we may have to fight across the street. You know what I mean. England has to have a tremendous navy, but that makes it unnecessary for her to have such a big army. I see you've got the idea exactly, Fleming, said a new voice breaking into the conversation. The two scouts looked up to see the smiling face of their scoutmaster, John Grinful. He was a big, bronzed Englishman, sturdy and typical of the fine class to which he belonged, public school and university man, first-class cricketer and a football international who had helped to win many a hard-fought game for England from Wales or Scotland or Ireland. The scouts were returning from a picnic on Wimbledon Common in the suburbs of London, and Grenfell was following his usual custom of dropping into step now with one group, now with another. He favored the idea of splitting up into groups of two or three on the homeward way, because it was his idea that one of the great functions of the scout movement was to foster enduring friendships among the boys. He liked to know, without listening or trying to overhear, what the boys talked about. Often he would give a directing word or two that, without his purpose becoming apparent, shaped the ideas of the boys. Yes, he repeated. You understand what we're trying to do in this country, Fleming. We don't want to fight. We pray to God that we shall never have to. But if we are attacked, or if the necessity arises, we'll be ready, as we have been ready before. We want peace. You want it so much and so earnestly that we'll fight for it if we must. Neither of the boys laughed at what sounded like a paradox. His voice was too earnest. Do you think England is likely to have to go to war soon, within a year or so, sir? asked Harry. I pray not, said Grenfell. But we don't know, Fleming. For the last few years, ever since the trouble in the Balkans finally flamed up, Europe has been on the brink of a volcano. We don't know what the next day may bring forth. I've been afraid. He stopped suddenly and seemed to consider. There is danger now, he said gravely. Since the Archduke Franz of Ferdinand of Austria was assassinated, Austria has been in an ugly mood. She has tried to blame Servia. I don't think Russia will let her crush Servia, not a second time. And if Russia and Austria fight, there is no telling how it may spread. You'd want us to win, wouldn't you, Harry, if we fought? asked Dick, when Mr. Grenfell passed on to speak to some of the others. Yes, I think I would. I know I would, Dick said Harry gravely. But I wouldn't want to see a war, just the same. It's a terrible thing. Oh, it wouldn't last long, said Dick confidently. we lick them in no time at all, don't you think so? I don't know. I hope so, but you can't ever be sure. I wonder if they'd let us fight. No, I don't think they would. There'd be plenty enough for the Boy Scouts to do, though, I believe. Would you stay over here if there was a war, Harry, or would you go home? I think we'd have to stay over here, Dick. You see, my father's here on business, not just for pleasure. His company sent him over here, and it was understood he'd stay yet several years. I don't think the war can make any difference. That's why you're here, then, is it? 
I used to wonder why you went to school over here instead of in America. Yes, my father and mother didn't want me to be so far from them, so they brought me along. I was awfully sorry at first, but now it doesn't seem so bad. I should think not, said Dick indignantly. I should think anyone would be mighty glad of a chance to come to school over here instead of in America. Why, you don't even play cricket over there, I've been told. No, but we play baseball, said Harry, his eyes shining. I really think I miss that more than anything else here in England. Cricket's all right if you can't play baseball. It's a good enough game. You can play, admitted Dick rather grudgingly. When you bowl, you have got some queer way of making the ball seem to bend. I put a curve on it, that's all, said Harry with a laugh. If you'd ever played baseball, you'd understand that easily enough. See, you hold the ball like this, so that your fingers give it a spin as it leaves your hand. And he demonstrated this for his English friend's benefit, the way the ball is held to produce an out curve. Your bowlers here don't seem to do that though they do make the ball break after it hits the ground. But the way I imagine it, you see, is to throw a ball that it doesn't hit the ground in front of the bat at all, but curves in. If you don't hit it, at, it will hit the stumps and bowl you out. If you do hit, you're likely to send it straight up in the air, so that some fielder can catch it. I see, said Dick. Well, I suppose it's all right but it doesn't seem quite fair. Harry laughed, but didn't try to explain the point further. He liked Dick immensely. Dick was the first friend he had made in England, and the best so far. It was Dick who had tried to get him to join the Boy Scouts, and who had been immensely surprised to find that Harry was already a scout. Harry, indeed, had done two years of scouting in America, he had been one of the first members of a troop in his home town, and had won a number of merit batches. He was a first-class scout, and he, had he stayed with his troop, would certainly have become a patrol leader. So he had no trouble in getting admission to the patrol to which Dick belonged. End of Chapter 1 Part 1 Recording by Kangaroo